if the trauma is still impacting you, then you're still framing it such that it's still actually happening. I'm a lot more aggressive about it. I'm regularly seeking to turn it into benefits as fast as possible. Dr. Benjamin Hardy is an organizational psychologist, best-selling author, the one, the only, Dr. Benjamin Hardy. The past is actually a representation of who I am now rather than who I am now, is a representation of my past. I want to write this down because yeah. I feel like that just yeah. blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do we help people become happier? Okay. Uh, if you're operating 2x, you're letting the past and present dictate what you do in the future. Whereas if you're operating 10x, you're always thinking about the 10x future and letting the future dictate what you do in the present. I, I feel like I'm so caught on just two things that do are- Do it, let's like, hear it. He's written eight books, including 10X is Easier Than 2X, Willpower Doesn't Work, and Be Your Future Self Now. His writing has been featured on publications like the Harvard Business Review, New York Times, Inc.com, and his life's work is on helping people create massive, positive change. The Icons is a show where we learn life lessons from those who achieved iconic success. My name is Tyler Way. We're in for a masterclass today. Dr. Benjamin Hardy, welcome to the Icons by Motiversity. And I thought we'd start on happiness, because I was struck by a study I came across recently that said, in the studies that ask people about happiness over, over time, it seems like happiness levels are just about an all-time low. How do we help people become happier? How I understand happiness is, is that a person's experience in the present is largely shaped by their relationship with their past and their relationship with their future. That's really how I see it as a, like a positive psychologist, I guess you could say. And so, from my view, happiness in the present is about having an increasingly purposeful, useful past, which is something you develop mastery on, something you get better and better at, uh, I guess you could say, utilizing your past, reframing it, uh, also re redeveloping your relationship with your past self and people in your past, as well as the relationship you have with your own future self, having a sense of purpose, having a sense of clarity, and utilizing that uh, to make better decisions in the present, build confidence, have a sense of meaning, similar to what Viktor Frankl would have said. Uh, you know, 70 years ago. So, I mean, it's, it's really about developing mastery of those two things, developing mastery over your own past, continually making it better, more useful, something you're grateful for no matter what it was, no matter how traumatic or disappointing, whatever it is, uh, and then getting clear and clear and more emotionally connected to your future self and ultimately operating from that. Hmm. And so you bring up this idea of future self, um, an area that you focus on. Can you help me understand what future self means? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we all... I guess the, the easiest way to start is identity. So identity is fundamentally two things. It's the story you have for yourself. It's a narrative, but it's not a singular narrative. It's the narrative you have of your past, present, and your future. And then, it's the, and then secondarily, it's your standards, which is essentially your floor and your ceiling. And so the story that we all have of our, well, I guess one way of looking at it is, is that we all have what would be considered a future. Uh, the typical way of having a future, though, is what would be considered by many a default future. So our brain is a prediction machine. Our brain's constantly making predictions or uh, what psychologists would call prospects, prospection. We have tons of different prospects for our future. Uh, and the default future is really the future that is most expected, most predicted, even if, even if it's the one that's not the most wanted. And so the goal of future self is to begin taking stock on that future, to begin thinking about it. Uh, a lot of research shows that even if, say, I asked you, you know, are you the exact same person you were 10 years ago? We went back to 2013. You know, we're, we're having this conversation in 2023. So if you went back to September of 2013 and really thought about who you were, what your life was like, what you were thinking about, even thinking about, you know, what your goals were, your values, your friends, your interests, you could probably see a massive change. So even after people do that, if we were to ask, well, who are you going to be in 10 years from now? Most people haven't really thought about it. And so most people assume that who they are in the present is going to, for the most part, be the same person they are in the future. And um, Daniel Gilbert, who's a Harvard psychologist, has been studying this for decades, attributes that mostly just to a lack of imagination, just that most people are not simply thinking about it. And so because they're not thinking about it, they just push the present into the future. From my perspective, it's a lot more useful to imagine the future and then pull the, pre uh, pull the future into the present. So yet let the future dictate what you do in the present rather than let the present dictate how you see the future. And it's a, it's a skill. It's honestly a skill. Developing imagination for your future self, starting to build the connection with that identity, and then honestly starting to operate from that identity. It's a, it's a skill that people can develop hmm. and that people do develop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds different than goals. I mean, a lot of people would have a dream or a goal. Obviously, they're connected. But what's the difference between kind of really 
imagining yourself in the future versus having a goal? I think that imagining your future self is what can inform your goals. And so like as an example, when I was uh, a graduate student, I really wanted to be a professional author. I, I saw that as something I wanted to do, and so that informed the goals I set, such as I want to get a book deal, uh, which, which goal subsequently you know, allowed me to go and start blogging online and learning how to develop an audience so that I actually could get that book deal. So my future self, the person I wanted to be, thinking about my identity, uh, identity and goals are highly co uh, correlated. And so, yeah, I think that that's what informs your goals is your future self. It's also okay. what ultimately allows them to be accomplished. If you study deliberate practice, deliberate practice is essentially getting connected to your future self and practicing as your future self. Obviously, there's a lot of mechanics with deliberate practice, but it's essentially operate when it's done well, you're connected to the future self. You're even operating as much as you can through, through that lens. So as an example, when I was... When I was blogging online, I was very connected to the idea of my future self being a professional author, having big book deals. And so that was the identity it would, like, that I would tap into when I would start blogging online, even as a beginner blogger. Uh, and I think that it was very contributory, I guess you could say, to my fast growth. Wow. So like, what do you mean by tapping into? Like, does that mean like, as you sit down at the computer, you're, you're envisioning you in a certain amount of time? Like, what do you mean tapping in? I mean, you've probably heard of the framework. There's a, there's a framework of be, then, do, then, have. Um, have you heard of that framework? No. Okay, okay. So um, I'll, I'll take you through two, two different frameworks. One is, is you know, to, get, to even think about your future self, you have to think about it, right? So that's the imagination piece. Albert Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge. This is what Daniel Gilbert said. Most people just don't think about their future self. So the first step is thinking about it. And honestly, uh, a lot of research from different scholars talking about the idea of vividness. You do want to get that future self to be more vivid. For my... From my view, I, I think about my future self quite long term, but also much more like, say, in the next like three years, who, mm -hmm. I, who I'm going to be in three years. Obviously, with a growth mindset, you're a lot more connected to or even uh, identified by your future self than a fixed mindset. Fixed mindset would be you're overly identified with who you are today or even who you were in the past. Growth mindset means you're not overly identified with who you are today. You know that who you are is flexible. So you're getting really, really connected with who you could be in the future, believing that your future self could be massively more capable, more skilled, more confident, et cetera. So, you want, so I guess the two, the two models I would give you is one is you want to go from thinking to feeling to knowing. Mm -hmm. Going from thinking, uh, and there's a lot of research as well on the idea of getting emotionally connected to your future self. And so you want to think about it, but ultimately you want to get to a place of knowing your future self, having a friendship with your future self, beginning to invest in your future self. Um, for me, reaching a place of acceptance, uh, acceptance, commitment, even gratitude, appreciation, and then you get to the place of knowing, where that's like that's where I would say you've, you're you're kind of at a place of confidence. You already you've reached a place of knowing that that's who you are now, even if there's not that much evidence. If you're building that evidence, you start to know that that's the direction you're going. You start to talk more about it. You're not that afraid of it. And mm -hmm. so like you just you're saying what I would say that knowing is also really connected with commitment, where like you are now like going to find the way. This fits you know, with Frankl as well, Victor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning, where he says when the why is strong enough, you, know, you can bear any how, but also when the why is strong enough, you will find the how. So this fits with hope and what would be considered pathways thinking, that once you get really committed, you have that place of knowing. And so that's, yeah. that's one of the models. I'll tell you the other one in a second after yeah, you share yeah, your no, thoughts I'm, on this. I'm just, I'm, I'm curious, because you, you shared an example of Mr. Beast in the opening of- I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, of, of one of your recent books. And, and you're talking about that he, in 2017, Correct me if I'm wrong. 15. 2015. Okay. So he filmed four different videos. Yep. He was 17 years yourself. old. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Tell me the story and why do you think that was so powerful for him? So, yeah. So Mr. Beast, obviously, we most people know who he is these days. If you don't know who he is, he's pretty much the biggest person on the internet. <laughs> but he's young. I think he's, um, so if I understand properly, he was 17 years old in 2015. So what does that make him today? That He's somewhere like 24, 24 years old. But basically, what happened was, and I don't know the exact date, I actually became aware of him in like 2019, 2020, uh, and I was watching his videos. I just thought he was fascinating. But what I saw in 2020, and I think it was October now that I think about it, was a video, and it had a picture of him. And it was like an a old picture of him from five years before. Really, like, it didn't look like his other videos, because his videos are like very well polished. Like, this was like a really like sloppy picture for the thumbnail and stuff like that. And it was him saying, like waving, and it said, hi, me in five years. And it's like two minutes long. So I click on it and I'm like, this is interesting. And it's an old video where he's 
17 years old, and it's back in 2015. So this is five years ago. And he's basically saying, you know, hey, this is me in you know, 2015. I'm filming a video talking to my future self five years into the future. So hey, future me. Uh, and he's basically just talking to his future self very publicly. Uh, and ultimately, if you go back, you can see that he actually that same night filmed multiple other videos. So basically what happened was is that night, he even says in the first video that he was skipping a history test to do this. And he was, I think he had been doing YouTube for quite some time, actually, before that. I think it was multiple years he had been doing YouTube. I think he started around age 12, so he'd been doing it like five years, but honestly had not made enormous progress. But that night, for one reason or another, he decided to film four YouTube videos, um, essentially just talking to his future self. Uh, one of them was for six months into the future, and he was very like direct about where he wanted his future self to be six months into the future. Then he did a year into the future, then he did five years, and then he did 10. So his 10-year one isn't even out yet. Um, but basically, in the six-month one, he was just, you know, and, and it is interesting the different time frames, because when you're thinking about your future self six months from now, it's a different conversation than if it's five years into the future. And you could even see that in his conversations with himself. Um, I liked it because what he ultimately did was he had these various conversations about two minutes each, and then he published them all onto his YouTube channel, but didn't set them to go live. He basically set them to go live at the associated time frame. So the six month one came out six months. He just set it to go live six months into the future. The other one, one year, five years. And so he actually had forgotten that he had filmed that. So in 2020, when the video came out, uh, his YouTube channel had like 45 million subscribers and he had forgotten that he had filmed it. In the video, he said he, he was like heavily committed that he would become a professional YouTuber by five years into the future and that he would have a million subscribers. And he was kind of desperately talking to his future self. Like he's like, I better have a million subscribers and stuff like that. But everyone was kind of humbled who was watching the, um, watch, you know, watching the video and posting the comments because he was like 45 million subscribers. By that point, he was massive and he was a, you could see that he was not the same person. And so I think it was just a beautiful time capsule to see like who he was and just to see how, how dramatic the change was over that five-year period of time. One of the things that I did when I was like very heavily studying him was you really can see if you go back to when he filmed those videos and then the videos like shortly thereafter, you can see a difference. You can, from my view, you can see the, like an extreme difference in his commitment um, that he made those videos for a reason. Like he was getting more and more committed to his goal. He had been doing it for four or five years, but now he's being more public with it. He's getting a lot more thoughtful and ultimately like his videos started changing. And he did surpass his six month goals. And then by the time his year long video came out, he was like way past where he projected himself to be. And then his, his growth curve just was massively exponential from there. Hmm. Yeah, I'm curious about the second framework, but is that like a, a a good example for someone who's trying to understand future self, but then go to action with it? Like, is that the kind of thing that people would do where they time capsule themselves or like, what are the type of activities people do to actually get into this practice? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's a really good one because that's essentially a letter to his future self. It's just mm -hmm. a, it's like a vocal letter and it's filmed and it's public, which adds so many additional elements rather than doing it uh, written in private, which is the more typical. Often people will write a letter to their future selves. Me and my wife even did this. Um, where basically a year into our marriage, uh, we decided to make a, a time capsule. So we were a year into our marriage and uh, we, we made a time capsule for our future selves at our 10 year wedding anniversary, which happened to be uh, last year. And so we opened that time capsule, but we, and I even forgot what was in it. And so we, we actually filmed videos, uh, stuck them in like, stuck them on flash drives, put them in a mason jar, wrote letters to each other saying like, so I wrote a letter to my, few, you know, to my wife nine years into the future. She wrote a letter to me saying, you know, Whatever, whatever, whatever she wanted to say. We also like had a shared document with our goals and individual documents with our goals, um, and so like that's that's an example. Uh, a lot of times in the in the research, there's a lot of research that basically says it's actually a lot more effective rather than like writing to your future self to actually get into the mindset of your future self and write a letter from your future self to you. Oh, interesting. Uh, and I have I have friends who do this every year. Where like say on January first rather than filming a video saying where they want to be uh, a year in the future, they'll actually film a video as their future self a year, a, a year ahead and say, this is what happened. Uh, and so they're kind of speaking from the future back. And I do that regularly where I'll sit in my journal. It could be three years in the future. And I'll literally think about the context of my future self, think about where I want to be. And I, I will then write a letter as my future self to me, who would be my future self's past self, three Three years, you know, so I'm speaking, say, today is sometime in September of 2023. So if I want to do this myself, I could, you know, 
back at, back at the hotel or back at my house, um, just sit and journal for, I, I really don't think it needs to take that long. Like you could just take 10 or 15 minutes. It's, it's really a skill. I think that the past and the future are skills. You get good at like drafting them. So you get better and better at being flexible. There's a huge concept in, psycho, uh, in psychology called psychological flexibility. And so a lot of this has to do with your ability to frame, reframe, see it from a different angle, not be so dogmatic about one angle or one view. Hmm. So I can know, for example, that my view of even today is going to change and that in a week from now, I'll have different perspectives. And so I don't need to be so, so clingy, I guess you could say, to one angle. But also that same thing can be true of my future self. And so I think you become a lot more flexible, less rigid about, you know, needing to do it right. I can do it as a draft, just like I would draft a blog post. And so I can get into the mindset, really think about my future self, think about where I want to be and play with it. I could play with my imagination, you know, back to Einstein. And then I can uh, just, if I want to, get into the mindset and just write myself a letter talking to my past self back in 2023, uh, it being 2026, and uh, just say, Here's where I'm at. Here's what I here's what I advise to you, Ben. Or here's you know here's the things that happen. Here are the big inflection points. I mean, you can just honestly practice, and you can get good at it. And uh, it's really just a tool for insight. The future and the past are just tools for effectively operating in the present. You, I mean, it's kind of coming to mind now when you're talking about your future self writing a letter to you. I almost had to stop and wrap my head around this when I read it in your book, Victor Frankl saying, "Imagine you've you're already in the future. Imagine you've already lived your life." And this moment is in the past. Yep. And you're about to make the mistakes you did then. I found that framing so interesting. I hopefully I'm getting it right. You are, yeah. That, that's that exactly so, what Frankl said. Yeah. And so it's that idea of really looking backwards as opposed to projecting forward has more power in this psychology. Yeah, and I think that when you are less dogmatic about your current view of the past. So as um, how I view it is, is that my past is a draft. And so, and really, that's how most uh, that's how most psychologists would view it. Uh, actually, not most, but that's how some psychologists would view it. Is is that the past is actually a representation of who I am now, rather than who I am now is a representation of my past. So I'll say that again. Basically, my own I want past. To write this down because yeah. I feel like that just yeah. blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, so when you're thinking about neuroscience, um, and you're even just thinking about memory in general, memory is always a reconstruction in the present. So if I was to think right now about last week, that would be different than if I was thinking about it a week from now. And a week from now, I'll be slightly different. I'll, have a, I'll be in a different context. A different, and so if I'm thinking back uh, a few weeks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in a different place. And so the main thing is, is, is that who you are in the present is basically what is creating the past. Obviously, the past influences who you are in the present. It's kind of a, a circular. But Memory is always a reconstruction in the present. And one of my favorite psychologists, he wrote a book called Time and Psychological Explanation. His name is Brent Slife. But he said that it's more accurate to say that the present causes the meaning of the past than to say that the past causes the meaning of the present. And so the, what I take from that and what I've learned from that is, is that who I am in the present, it's, it's, it's largely up to me what I do with my past, how I frame it, whether I utilize it or whether I believe it's driving me. Um, and I've learned more and more to use my past as a tool, but also to turn it into an asset where I create more and more value from it, where I can learn more and more from it. The only reason I bring this up now is because I can, I can right here, you know, with you, think back on just the last 12 months, and I can think about my decisions. I can think about what went well, what could have gone differently. I can analyze my decisions differently because I can have hindsight. And so what Frankl is inviting you to do is not only get good at that, but to get good at being in the future, and rather than moving forward in time, you're letting, the, you're letting the future look backward in time so that you don't have to make needless errors. I mean, certainly we will all continue to, you know, fumble our way forward, but you can do it with a lot more thought, a lot more insight. And I, I apply this quite regularly. Uh, I even share in that book how I do it to be a lot more present with my children, just thinking about, you know, do I really want to do I really want to have this argument with my son? Like is this really going to be worth it in a you know in a week from now? Is this something that's going to be damaging or would, how would my future self want me to handle this? Mm. Even in a even in an hour from now, you know, what what would be this what would what would my future self wish I had done in this situation? Mm. And so it's just it just allows you to to think about it and be more thoughtful rather than reactive. It's interesting because when I was reading your your book on future self, books on future self, um, one of the things that came to mind is this idea that 
okay, I, I love this idea. But economists would also say, you know, people are really trapped by their socioeconomic realities. And, True. and so, you know, if you think about the average, not the average, but, you know, 40 some percent of Americans, if they get a thousand dollar bill, don't know where that money comes from. So it's this, you know, grandiose idea to imagine your future self, but you're so locked in the present. And so it feels like the way you're helping people reframe their current experience and, and, and understand their past differently allows them to project forward. Is that a, a fair way to see it? Or how totally. would you how would you offer advice to somebody who feels like this all sounds cool, Dr. Benjamin, but I'm literally locked in the moment right now. And I, I don't have a lot of headspace or slack in my life to do anything otherwise. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I have six kids. Life can be busy. You know what I mean? It, it, it's easy to get caught in the present. And honestly, that's the, uh, that's the bias we actually all have. So there's a lot of research from Dr. Hal Hirschfeld. He has studied the future self concept or this idea for 20 years. And it's, it's, it's most common, honestly, for us to downplay our future selves, for us to push, push the future self off uh, and to downplay how they will feel. So how Hirschfeld looks like that, he, how he looks at that is, is it's a lack of empathy for your own future self. And so instead, we, we put a magnifying glass on our current situation, our current emotions. And even if I'm bored, you know, I'm sitting at work, I may be so bored um, that I, I magnify that emotion and I make it a bigger deal than it needs to be. And then I'll go and do something to distract myself, right? Which may be useful or maybe actually very negative for myself even in 10, 20 minutes. Uh, and so it's actually the bias to overly infatuate on our present self. Uh, and, and the world can be this way too. I mean, the internet is very distracting. All sorts of things are, are seeking to give us immediate rewards. And so not only uh, are, do we have a bias towards immediate rewards, but we also just, we're, we're more, I guess you could just say we overly value our current emotions and we, we tend to not worry so much about our future self. And so basically to, uh, one thought I will say to this person that you're describing is, is like it's very common to get absorbed in the present and to, and to think that the present is all that matters rather than to kind of thoughtfully look at it, maybe get in touch. And getting in touch with your future self is very similar to just honestly meditation. Um, it's, it, it's not the same as meditation, but it could be a form of meditation. And so I would argue if you're not taking time regularly, even to just sit and just like think for even like five or 10 minutes, but like that everything feels too overwhelming, then you're, at, from my view, you're definitely like probably off course. And like, so getting connected to the future self, a lot of it's just really about like, am I on the right track? Am I on a track I want to be on? Do I like this? It's really a way of having conversations with yourself. Um, it's very in line with just the whole framework of important versus urgent, right? And so it's like if everything feels urgent and you're not connected to what's important, then you're probably not making massive strides forward. You're probably on autopilot. You're probably on, on the hamster wheel. So I think it's extremely important, even if you feel stressed, even if you feel busy, even if you feel like you don't have those five minutes to just go and sit and sit in your journal and just write all the things you're sure, you probably need that more than anyone. But you never reach a point when you don't need that. You never reach a point when you don't mm. need those 10 minutes. Mm. Um, it's a continuous process of, of clarity and of, of making progress and of, of learning to prioritize and learning self-awareness. And so we all need it. Um, we can all get overly, overly absorbed in the present by the stresses of it and then downplay our future. So it's, I think it's very common. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just jotting this down, but I... I I want to ask in a moment about trauma because I feel like it adds a bit of a different piece to it. But um, two things are coming to mind right now is, you know, if someone had five minutes and wanted to start this, like they're bought in, um, what, would, what would somebody do? I've got, I've got five minutes of my day. That's all I got. What would be the practice that I get into? I would honestly actually start, if you only are going to give yourself five minutes, period, flat, actually do it at night. Okay. Um, so do it at night. And, and if you would or could... So research shows that 90% of people procrastinate sleep by just mindless scrolling. And so they're literally procrastinating sleep yeah. and literally putting their future self in a hole the next morning because of mindless consumption. So, and we all, you know, that's very common. And so it's, in my view, what you do in the last hour of your day is the most potent form of habit formation. So like what we do at night, right before we sleep is going to inform our habits way more than any other period of the day. Um, and so 
a lot of huge, huge amount of research on this, that if you just simply at the end of your day, pull out your journal and just write down three things from that day that you are grateful for. It's so basic, but it's shown dramatically to increase happiness and to increase sleep quality. Hmm. It just gets things down, but also if you just give yourself three to five minutes, a lot of times because people are not practiced at this, and I, I have different iterations of this. I have, uh, in my mind, a lot deeper forms of reflection than just simply writing what you're grateful for. But this is like a, honestly, just a start because it trains people to look back at the day and to think about it and to just simply say, and you know, then the initial reaction, if I ask my three, you know, my older three kids who are teenagers, what are you, what are you happy about from the day or what are you grateful for? I'll sometimes just say literally nothing. Hmm. And it's like, well, then think about it. Hmm. What happened today? What could you be grateful for? Um, and so by actually thinking about it, and pondering it, they'll say, well, actually, you know, that person at work was super nice to me. I'm grateful for that. Like, so now they're starting to take ownership of their past. They're starting to create the frame. They're starting to actually pull usefulness from it. And so they can then think, well, today actually was pretty great. Or, or there was components yeah, of today yeah. that were all right. And so just by simply doing that, that's a, that's a great start. My, my view is, is you can take it a step further. Because um, that would be yeah. shape, That would be kind of providing meaning or, or kind of looking back and reshaping how you're interpreting now. Like that's a that's, that's a what you're doing. Right? Reflection. You are shaping the meaning of the past in the present in your journal, and but, you're now framing the day as useful. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And so I think that, that idea of like gratitude journals makes sense. I'm curious how it connects to the future self part because look, you know, reflection is is a different mechanism than looking forward. So then, yeah. what's that piece look like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Well, so, so here's how I do it. I actually don't do it in that form, but that's like honestly basic. Okay. Like, if people, like really, if, if people really want to get started and they only have five minutes and they're not. So how I do it is, and this is still starting with the night. How I do it is, is at the end of the day, I think how am I different from who I was when I woke up? The reason this is super important, I know that this is not future self, this is me again re-relating to my past self, is, is that if I thought about it, just like with thinking about those three gratitudes, if I actually think about it, and I say, how am I a different person than I was this morning when I woke up? The initial reaction would be, I'm not. It's only been like 12 hours. How could I be different? But if I really think about it, what do I now know that I didn't know before? Um, what, you know, what experiences have I had that my prior self hadn't had when I had just woken up? And if I actually think about it, just like gratitude, I'm creating the frame of my past. I actually can and do see that I am different than my past self, even 12, 13 hours ago or the night before. 24 hours ago. And by, by actually focusing on that and by appreciating that, I now acknowledge that I've changed, which increases my psychological flexibility. It allows me to see that I am not the same person, that I am growing, that I am evolving, which is really useful for then getting skillful at, re, you know, at thinking of your future self as a different person. If I'm different from who I was 24 hours from now, then it's, it's likely that my future self could be different in 24 hours in positive, meaningful, and even self-directed ways. And so I just think that it's really mastery of the past is, is very powerful for also developing mastery of your future. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to note, yeah, yeah, note that. Yeah. Anyway, I'm very happy to share starter points on getting connected to the future self. But I just think that it's, it's incredibly useful to, to recognize the differences between your current and your past self and also very useful to be explicit about that. And by writing it down, that's actually part of the integration process. Um, it actually creates change that would not have been there if you hadn't done that process. If I didn't do that at night, then there are certain changes that would not have occurred because I didn't think about it and because I didn't frame it and because I didn't make it explicit and say, oh, here's how I'm different from my past self. You know, Maybe I was a lot more thoughtful in this conversation right? than maybe I would have been a week ago or even than I was yesterday. And so by writing it down, I've now made that change more potent than it would have been had I not done that. And so it's a, I think that that's really powerful. I would say one other really th important thing here is, is in recognizing that I'm not my past self, whether it's 24 hours ago or whether it's 10 months ago, I have nothing but empathy for my past self. Uh, I, I'm not carrying around a past self that I'm angry at. I don't have any regrets because I'm not the same person as my past. They were operating from a different framework. Um, and so the future self is the same. My future self is insanely empathetic towards my current self. My future self... Uh, has way more wisdom, perspective, context than I do. And so it allows me a lot of freedom to make mistakes, which is a huge aspect of having a growth mindset. Fixed mindset means you're afraid of making mistakes, afraid of trying new things, afraid of, um, you know, being wrong. I mean, a fixed mindset means that you really are dogmatic and fragile. And so you, 
you don't want to be wrong. Whereas if I know that my future self has better perspectives, uh, then I'm okay making mistakes. I'm okay trying new things. I think people need to hear that. I think, I think that's really powerful. I think people need a way to be empath, to have empathy towards their past were. self. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's huge. Yeah, there's no value in not. Um, and I think that, again, as all things, it's a skill. But you can, you can have empathy towards your past self, present self, and your future self. But, uh, and, and what Daniel Gilbert would say is, is that your present self is as present as the, as, as fleeting as the present moment. And so like, I know that I'm constantly in a state of change, especially if I'm seeking to be, and if I'm constantly connected with my future self, yet also constantly reframing the meaning of my past. Um, but yeah, I think that it's, it's, very, it's very freeing to, to not, I'm not saying you're letting your past self off the hook, but what you're doing is, is you're acknowledging that they were operating from a different place. And it fits with having empathy, it fits with having love, it fits with having compassion. You can also apply this to other people. Um, you know, someone who may have hurt you or someone who have let you down um, to apply the same things, that they're not the same person. And if you were to actually have a conversation with them about it and get some understanding from their shoes, uh, you would see things differently. So can we dig into the that a bit deeper? Like I'm curious on the trauma side. So I just came across this stat that 60% of Americans will have trauma in their life and have PTSD. And so to me, that's not just, I mean, part of it's having empathy for your past self, but there's a, a moment or something locked in time or a trigger that's just causing you to keep getting pulled back there. How, how could this be applied to help somebody get unlocked from something that feels very traumatic in that way? Yeah, uh, obviously we, you know, you're not given the toolkit <laughs> when you're born yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to having what, what I'm calling psychological flexibility. This is a, a really high bar of what would be called emotional intelligence. Um, but the more emotionally intelligent you get, again, the less dogmatic you see a certain thing. And so from my view, trauma is typically, certainly it was an insanely unexpected, painful emotional experience that um, is continuing to impact you now. Even if you're long away from the experience, uh, if, if the trauma is still impacting you, then you're, you're still framing it such that it's still actually happening, which is, which is really interesting. Um, there is a lot of research that even shows, obviously having a conversation about it with someone is useful. Um, further research showing if you can just think about what you learned from it. So that's a big part of post-traumatic growth. I'm a lot more aggressive about it, uh, frankly. Like, I'm, I'm regularly seeking to turn it into benefits as fast as possible, which is, um, it fits along the lines of anti-fragile versus fragile. So like anti-fragile is a framework created by Nassim Taleb, but it's really about how no matter what happens to you, whether you're at a peak or in a valley, whatever, if it's, if it's something negative, you're as soon as possible turning it into benefits, um, turning it into gains would be the language that we use. Anti-fragile is what it's called. Oh yeah, anti-fragile means that it's the opposite of fragile. So fragile means if something negative happens, um, you know, you're worse off as a result. It creates more entropy into the future. Um, and that's also a view where the past is driving the present. Yep. But if you recognize that it's actually the present that, re that drives the past, that, you know, and I'm talking purely in psychological terms, that it's the present drives that- the meaning of the past. Deeply, yeah. It, it, it drives the framing of the past, the context, which determines the content um, the angle. And so if I know that, even if I, you know, this is not as traumatic as we're talking about, where we're talking about PTSD, although, you know, I've gone through extreme trauma, adopted three, you know, kids went through the foster system who they've had trauma. But even if I have a conversation, say with my 15 year old son, and it just doesn't go well, like I honestly, I don't handle it well. Um, I have a choice. Like I either can Re re reshape it, reshape the meaning of that conversation, turn it into something beneficial, um, turn it into learning and growth, or just let it be. Uh, and, and if I don't do anything about it, then the past is going to dictate the present rather than the present dictating the past. And so um, from my standpoint, it, it's just very useful for me to know that either on a time frame, so let me just say like from here to the last year, or specific events. I have a lot of control over what those mean. I have a lot of control over framing what it means. What does my last year mean? What was the good of it? What was, you know, do I wanna, do I wanna look at it from a positive or from a negative, but also specific events? My parents getting divorced, right? Me being in a, a car crash that almost kills my mom, right? I can think on certain events and I can say, 
Well, there's one of two ways. Either my present is, is shaping it or it's shaping my present. And usually with trauma, the past is still determining the present. There isn't a lot of proactive in the present taking control, approaching it, um, and wanting to do something about it. You, you have, you can't, it's not going to change in a positive way by chance. It literally has to by choice. You have to decide. You have to decide, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to learn from this. I'm not going to keep seeing it the same way. Can you say that again? The, I think that that's always true with trauma. So it's is, not going to happen by chance. No, and sometimes the tools are above your pay grade. I get that. Sometimes, sometimes and, but that's also part of choice, is saying, I may not have the tools to do this. That fits with Frankl directly as well, which is when the why is strong enough. Um, although he would quote Nietzsche saying, when the why is strong enough, you can bear anyhow. But for me... I'm more interested in the research on hope that talks about pathways thinking. When the why is strong enough, you will find the how. And often that means also finding the who, finding people who can give you the tools, the resources. Um, and so, yeah, if you're ready, you know, and it, it takes time, you know, to get to that place of commitment, but it, it is a place of choice. Um, you have to choose to, to change it. You have to choose to change what it means, choose to change from it so that you're not the same person uh, as the one who experienced it. You know, it could be the next morning. I'm not the same person who had the same conversation with my son where I was actually not being very empathetic or I was listening. I'm choosing to be different. And I'm choosing to go and talk to him about it and say, you know, it's, yesterday I was totally off. You know I mean? I was not listening. Um, I'm really sorry about that. That is literally reshaping the meaning of that conversation. Oh. And, then, and then saying, like, you know, can we try that again? Like, I, I want to try again on that. I, I could have done better there. Or I, or I just wasn't, I wasn't paying attention to you. I'm really sorry. Um, now that's reforming what we think about that conversation. Obviously, that's not to the extent of the extreme forms of PTSD we're talking about. But I think you, you do have to go back. Mm -hmm. you're, I mean, you, you have to. You have to approach it. There's either approach mindset or avoid mindset. You're either approaching it or you're avoiding it. Everything is approach or avoid. And at some point, you have to directly approach it and decide, I'm going to do something different here. I'm going to look at this different. Everything is approach or avoid. Wow. Everything is approach yeah, or avoid. Yeah. I've got, I've got, I feel like I've got so many questions forming, but... You mentioned Go ahead and throw it. No, I mean, we can, a, we can work on second this. framework you wanted to bring up, and so I just want to circle back. I mean, I don't know if it's directly useful anymore. Okay. Um, I think that uh, I, I just want to emphasize really quickly what we're saying, that the past is either an asset or it's a liability. And if it's an asset, that means it's something that's continuing to pay you more and more. You believe that the present and future are better as a result. Um, that, there, that because of that experience, you're continuing to get kind of interest in the present and future, whereas if it's a liability, you believe it's continuing to drain your present and future. And that is all based on how you're choosing to frame it, what you're choosing to do with it. And in the beginning, you may not feel like you have choice in the matter. Like, how could you see it any different? Yeah. Um, and that's like the ability to get to the point where you, where you start to try and you start to believe that it's possible, and then you start to work on it, maybe even start to get help in looking at it from a different angle, starting to learn from it, starting to um, think that it was something useful. Even if you, you, you could find reasons, just like finding things you're grateful for mm. at the end of the day, you've got to like actually exert some creativity on it. You have to actually, like, and it is creativity, yeah, just yeah. as much as creativity towards your future. Because I think that those were my questions. It really, you know, I had a lot of questions, but where I was kind of hung up coming into the conversation was, the power of the past. And so what's been interesting in this conversation is that it's almost like building your muscle by, by working on your past is, is a big part of what allows you to have that kind of flexible psychology for the future. I mean, it feels like there's been a lot of discussion about the past almost to give you that muscle to now get into that place where you can start to shape things differently. And I think it's continuous. It's not like you just master the past yeah. and spend five years on that so that we can now focus on the future. I feel like it's daily. I'm getting more and more connected from my future self and operating from that filter, but I'm also refiltering my past, um, wow. refiltering or reframing. So I, I do it daily. And I think you can practice uh, you know, empathy towards your past self. Practice looking at an event that you consider traumatic and asking what good could could have come from this or what good has come from this. Just try it. Remember, it's a draft. Tomorrow, maybe you'll have a little, a little bit more space to grab a little bit more value from it if you want to. Hmm. Um, and your future self will see it from a different perspective. You've brought up this term before, gap mentality, and I'd never heard it before. Can you give me a sense of what gap mentality means? 
Yeah, so this is a, a framework that was initially created by Dan Sullivan. Dan Sullivan being a guy that I wrote three books with. He's an entrepreneurial coach who's been coaching entrepreneurs for 50 years. He's just very good at creating frameworks. Um, for me, I liked his framework of the gap and the gain because it fits so much with all the stuff we're just talking about right now, which is a lot of the core components of future self. Uh, I'm sorry, a lot of the core components of positive psychology. Um, but basically the gap and the gain framework in simple terms is, and he works directly with high achievers, but I feel like it's, uh, I feel like it's relevant for all people. Um, but he does work specifically with really successful entrepreneurs and what he found in just observing them. He didn't do any like, you know, research or dig into the literature, but he was just observing his clients who, you know, paying him lots of money and were high, high achieving entrepreneurs. But he just noticed that and he met with them every 90 days. That was just kind of part of the process. And he would notice very regularly that they would downplay their success. And he just wondered why. Like, and like, so he would ask a various client, like, you know, what happened in the last 90 days? And they'd say, oh, nothing great. And he's like, what do you mean nothing great? And, they'd say, and he's like, you know, literally nothing good happened. And they're like, well, you know, I got this new client or that new client. But, you know, it doesn't matter because this is what should have happened. Or this is what could have happened. You know, and this is the whole idea of just downplaying. And so he, he viewed the gap. And we built a whole book around it, and I, I, deep, I kind of developed uh, more of the psychology and the research side behind it. But the idea of the gap is just always measuring yourself against uh, the moving horizon, which is your future self, honestly. But it's, 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 the less, it's the less defined future self. It's just your ideals. And those ideals might have come from society. They might have been planted in your mind by social media. Um, but we all have ideals. Um, that's just what we, what we think we want. Uh, and high achievers particularly, but I think people in general, and I can explain to you how even parents do this or teachers or coaches, but we tend to measure ourselves against that horizon, which is constantly moving. If you're running towards the horizon, you know, in the desert, you're never going to get there. It's going to keep going. And so it doesn't matter how many steps you take towards it. If you're always measuring yourself against it and feeling like a loser for not being there, uh, then no matter where you are, you'll feel like a loser. And, and that's the tip. That's very common. It's, uh, in psychology, they even call it the hedonic treadmill, which destroys happiness, which is just always measuring yourself against the next thing. Um, and so the gain is really the opposite. Rather, I mean, certainly you want a future self. Um, for me, my future self, I'm very connected to, and even as stated before in this conversation, operating more and more as uh, and filtering everything I do from the lens of my future self. But in terms of measuring my progress, rather than measuring myself against my future self, I'm actually measuring myself backwards against my past self. And so that's recognizing the gain. And so even if I've, um, you know, even if today didn't go so well, I can measure myself against where I was the day before and I can find gains. I can find progress. As I said, how, how, how did I learn something today? Um, or what, how have I progressed in the last 12 months? And just writing it down. And you can be really basic about this. Um, you could even just write it down in bullets. Um, like seriously, at the end of the week, just say, what key progress did I make this week? Uh, what were the positive experiences I had or what were the important wins or the important learnings? And if you just literally write it down, uh, this takes the whole gratitude practice like multiple levels further where you're like, actually, because a lot of times, especially with high achieving people, they're so focused on next, which is awesome, that they don't take any time to, to actually measure progress. Hmm. Um, and from a confidence standpoint, confidence is, comes from achievements from the past. And it can propel the future, but if you're not actually measuring that progress, then you're missing so much value. And so it just—it's I think it's a, an amazing dopamine kick. It's also a, just an amazing booster just to actually like think what happened in the last 90 days. Mm -hmm. And when you tend to do that, you will, you're also training your brain what to see from your past, which creates expectations for what you'll see in the future. So if I train myself at the end of every day to say, what were three important forms of progress today? Again, I'm training myself to look for those in my past. Uh, in psychology, they call it selective attention. So like I'm training my brain to find things. You know, we're always, you know, our brains are all trained to find what we're looking for. Hmm. But you're training yourself to see progress. And so those things then create expectations for the future. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's just kind of the gain yeah, mindset. Yeah. It's the opposite of the gap. People live in the gap. I mean, I'll, I'll just say one thing real quick. And that's, as a parent, I know I'm in the gap when I'm, my son plays tennis. If I just am always, you know, he plays a tournament, loses, right? And I just tell him all the things he could have done better. Or even if he won, I'm only telling him the things he could have done better. He comes home with his grades and is all I see is the one B, right? Like, I think it's very typical for a, t a coach, a teacher, or a parent to only see the gap 
But the problem is, is that, that that measuring stick is constantly moving. Like, and so if I'm doing that to my son, then is all he feels from me is where he's not showing up. What I'm not doing is I'm not telling him, hey, Caleb, like, we can certainly address those things, but I'm not showing him where he was three months ago or six months ago. And the fact is, is that the, the progress has been dramatic. And if I can show him that or help him learn how to do that, then he can decide the meaning of his own experiences rather than paying attention to mine. It's, I, I bet you a lot of parents are going to hear that. It, it remind, you brought up a quote in, in, um, in your writing. I think it's an Ernest Hemingway quote where he says, nobility is not about being better than others. It's about true nobility is about being better than who you were. Yeah, totally. It has yeah. nothing to do with other people. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So, but this, this, so this idea of high achievers, what have you found since exploring this idea of gap or gain? Because if, if this idea of the gap is a defining characteristic of high achievers, is that actually what's allowing them to be successful? Like if they start to use the gain mentality, do they up happiness but lose effectiveness? Or, or what have you found over time? No, that's what they believe is what's making them successful. Okay. Uh, is, is that they're never happy. They're never satisfied. Um, it's not actually what's, it's not actually a factor. Um, like you can be in the gain. I can be in the gain. And you will actually be more effective for multiple reasons. Um, first off, you will appreciate your progress. You will, you will feel, you will feel good. Like fundamentally, feeling good is, is beneficial for making progress. Um, but it doesn't kill ambition. It actually increases it over time. But it increases intrinsic motivation rather than extrinsic. I think often the gap is trying to fill some hole from unresolved trauma, bad relations with your parents. or you know, Often high achievers are literally trying to fill a hole. Um, and so that hole is the gap um, that they're trying to fill, and they'll never feel it. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an internal issue that they're trying to fill with external accomplishments. And they'll never actually fill it. And so they'll never actually have a positive relationship with themselves. Certainly it can fuel all sorts of uh, success. But the question that you have is, is the question with this topic. And the, the question is, if you removed the gap, which you'll never remove it, by the way. Mm. Every per- it's not like you'll just diminish it. Every person's going to continue oh, to go in the gap. I think that's terrifying. Yeah, you're never going to. It's not like you just flip a switch where you're never going to go there. I, I go there regularly, uh, and I think it's a useful tool to be in the gap. I think that you learn from it, but you, don't, you, won't, you, won't, um, you won't be benefited by it until you start turning it into a personal gain, until you start turning it into meaning, learning, growth. Uh, and what I get out of the gain and what I see others get out of it and what Dan has seen, you know, ultimately studying this for 50 years, is, is that it reorients yourself towards towards your progress and towards your future rather than needing it. Because usually when you're in the gap, you think you need the thing to be worthy or to be successful. No matter what you've accomplished in the past, none of it matters because I need that thing. Um, and if you're operating out of need, then, then it's an unhealthy attachment, right? Whereas when you start living from a gain perspective, not only do you increase the value of who you are in the present, because um, you're in the same position, whether you're in the gap or the gain. One makes your present feel like trash, you know, because it's not that. It also makes your past trash because it could have been something else. If someone's in the gap, they mean that it means that they believe their past should have been something different because they're not happy with where they're at. They should be somewhere else. So being in the gain ultimately allows your past to be valuable, to be useful. It also increases the value of where you're at in the present rather than starting at ground zero every day. You're starting with rocket fuel from your past. Um, but again, how you look at your past trains what you'll expect from your future. So if I feel phenomenal about my past, if I feel phenomenal about my progress, um, all of those things only boost my intrinsic motivation towards what I most want, not what I think I need. I don't need any future achievements. But there's certain things I absolutely want to do, and I absolutely will go and get them. Um, And being in the gain allows you to stop what you were just describing, needing to be in any forms of comparison or even worrying about what anyone's opinion is of my goals, or of my own progress. My progress is my own, but also so is my goals. And so I, for me, I feel it, it boosts healthy, a healthy fuel source of intrinsic motivation, of, of wanting rather than unhealthy attachment and thinking you need this thing, which is going to be a continuous rabbit hole to nowhere. That's in, that, that idea of need versus want. I've never thought about that before. And because I would frame a lot of things in that, you know, the power of need. If I can put it, like... It's that important to me. I'm going to have that much more to go towards it. But you're saying that you almost lose power. I, I think it's suffocating. Over oh, time. interesting. I think, I think that it's. I think that it's. Um, 
it can get you places for a while. It's certainly a fuel source to think you need it. Um, but I think over time, getting to a place where you, you pursue it because you want it, um, it, it's, it doesn't have to be as weak. Like it, a, lot of, a lot of times people think that it's weak, but I mean, um, I can want something extremely um, and even be insanely committed to it without, without thinking I need it. Hmm. Um, and my fuel for it, my strategy for it is, is not, I mean, I can, I can strategize for it just as powerfully. Hmm. One of the things that's so cool about this show is that, uh, you know, shaped around icons, it's not just people who have great ideas, it's also people who have the street cred, but they've actually pulled it off. They've actually done it. They've actually had the success. What, you know, I'm caught in your story in the sense that you've got six children, you've written eight books at, at, a, at a young age. I mean, you are producing at a high level. And, and one of the articles that you read, that you wrote that went viral was around kind of the 80-20 principle. Can you kind of flush that out for me? Because I just think that for people who, again, feel like all of this sounds great, but I'm flat out. Like I don't have the time to create space for any of the stuff we're talking about. What's the concept around 80-20 and how could maybe they apply that to, to get more flexibility? So the unique angle on 80-20 that I feel like Dan Sullivan and I um, contributed was around 10x versus 2x thinking. So we've been talking about gap and gain. Again, one of the beauties of Dan's thinking is he thinks in terms of di- like opposites. Um, and so when we were writing that book, uh, 10x is easier than 2x. Um, We were really going deep into the conversations between a future orientation or a past orientation. So just to give it super simple, and then we'll go into the 80-20 of it. Uh, If you're going for a a 2x mindset, 2x growth in anything, right? It's very linear. It's very much taking the past and the present and projecting that into the future. So it's like, you know, this is, and really you don't have to transform that much to go for 2x growth. Um, You're really just continuing more of what you're doing, and it's pretty predictable. Like, you may have to make various tweaks, and so... Um, 10x mindset is completely the opposite. 10x is a future that's so big and seemingly impossible, um, but it's also a future mindset back to imagination, back to Albert Einstein, where you're letting the future frame what you do in the present. And so 10x is a future orientation towards the present, whereas 2x is a present orientation towards the future. You're letting the present dictate what you do in the future, whereas 10x is a future model that you're utilizing in the present to do to decide what you do. And that's, that's even in a basic way what the research on future self says. And this is a lot more basic. I mean, when we're going to go into 80-20, it's more technical. But the basics of, of future self is, is getting connected to your future self such that you let the future self dictate what you do in the present, whether that means making the healthy choice, whether that means being kind, whether that means uh, beginning to invest in your future, right? Um, so when it comes to like scaling that to a 10x level and now going into the 80-20, there's just a, a framework that we, that we made for that book. But basically, if you're going to go for 2x of anything, you can keep 80% of your life. Um, you really don't have to transform. Um, if I'm going for two times the, the book sales that I had last year, most of my strategy that I'm applying right now can work. And so you really can keep 80% of your life, 80% of your habits, 80% of your mindset. You can just, to go 2x, you just transform 20%, whatever that means. Maybe try a different strategy, get a different employee, or, or do, you know, work harder. Um, and so the 10x is going to be the opposite. The future is so big that the filter is so high um, that you know, 80% of what you're doing now won't get you to 10x. That's the main idea. And this comes from a lot of the research from constraint theory, uh, a lot of it from Dr. Alan Bernard, who studied the idea of impossible goals, that if you're going for, say, 10% in anything, the problem with 10% growth is, is that there's too many options to get there. You could do a thousand different things to grow your business by 10%. But if you want to grow by 10x, um, almost nothing would work. It's just too big. And almost everything you're doing right now, call it 80% or more, would be filtered out. It just, it's, it's a distraction. It's in the 80% using the 80-20 principle. And so I find that it's very difficult to deploy the 80-20 principle without huge goals. Um, I mean, you can do it. You can honestly just, you know, and this is more like Tim Ferriss-ish, but you could just look at your life and just analyze, like, um, you know, the 20% of the people in your life that are creating 80% of your stress. Um, for me, I look at it more like 80% of my life is my past self. And only, like, only 20%, that best 20% with the most upside is, is relevant to my, call it my 10x future self. Only 20% 
has, has any reflection to my 10x future self. And those are the areas I want to go deep on. And uh, it, this, like all things, is a skill. But what I think is great with it is, is like, I know that 80% of what I do with my time is mostly maintenance at this point. It's maintaining the status quo. Or it's literally holding me back. It could be bad habits, distractions, addictions. 80% of my life right now is not moving me forward, very marginally. And effectiveness when it comes to decision making and even like using your time well and learning is recognizing the things in your life that aren't moving you forward. And then, and that's part of the reflection and saying, okay, these aren't moving me forward. What are the few things that are or where can I find those new pathways? And so I, I think it's very useful to find the 20% or to let the future dictate the 20% and then to just focus your attention more and more on that and to let go of more and more. That, that takes commitment. It takes courage to strip out that. But as you do that, you're literally letting go of your past self and your attention's going deeper, which is really what creates massive growth. Because that was my immediate reaction. I mean, the, the idea of the 80-20 towards optimization, cool. 80-20 towards my identity, yeah, that's that's what it terrifying. is. That's how I see it. That's terrifying and exciting. Like both at this, like I can feel it in me just even thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, so I use the example of Michelangelo in that book, Ten X is Easier Than Two X, and Michelangelo was describing to the Pope how he created the David statue, and he just said, "I stripped away everything that was not David. I took away everything that's not David." So how I look at it is, is that your future self is that David. Your future self, call it the Ten X version of your future self, the next level version of your future self is that. And to get there, you strip away everything that's not that. And that is ultimately, you know, in this language, 80% of who you are right now, which can be terrifying, like you said. Um, but back to the idea of psychological flexibility is, is that, that the 80% of your life right now is what got you here, but it's not what's going to get you there. Even phenomenal things. Um, you know, I'll use myself as an example, and I've used this example before, but, you know, when, my, when I was in my first year of my PhD program, uh, I really want to be a professional author. And so, like, that was my quote-unquote 10x. That was my David, right, on that stage of time. And, and so by clarifying the goal, I was able to identify the 20% that would get me there. There's not a lot of things that could give me that goal. I can't do a 1,000 things to become a professional author. I can only do a few things that are deeply relevant to that goal. Uh, in this case, getting really, really good at blogging and growing a massive email list and, you know, being published on various platforms. Like, those were the things that were very directly related to that goal. That was the 20% that if I focused on and got really good at, went deep on, um, call it got 10 times better at the 20% and let go of the 80, which was my university position. Um, and I was the only person in my PhD program that paid tuition because uh, I didn't do those things. I was focused on my 20%. Um, and so, but, but the point is, is that when I actually did get 10 times better and I did achieve that goal, I became my new version of the future self. Well, then at that new position, I had a different future self. And it wasn't just continuing what I was on. Uh, blogging, which was deep in my 20%, went into my 80%. It got me here, but it won't get me there. That was my past self. And I think one of the difficult things is, is that when, when your past is good, like when you've, had, when you've been making progress um, to let go because you're still letting the future dictate what you do, not the past. Even if it was an excellent past that's growing you phenomenally. Hmm. Um, and I, you know, in recent past, you know, even just describing these books I wrote with Dan, like it got to the point where my future self and the, using the future as the filter was like, you know, if this, if this doesn't change so that it's 10x, then this is also more a reflection of my past and my future. And so, you know, ultimately the collaboration came to a conclusion and we're all in the game about it. We're all stoked about it. But it was an example of, it was phenomenal. It had a lot of momentum. We could have kept doing more books, but that's the past. And if you're operating 2x, you're letting the past and present dictate what you do in the future. Whereas if you're operating 10x, you're always thinking about the 10x future and letting the future dictate what you do in the present. You're letting, the, and if it's a 10x future, then the filter is really fine, meaning that only 20% or less is relevant. Even some of the great things you're doing, and so that's one of the reasons why it's beautiful is, is that it, it invites you to new pathways. It invites you to think creatively, and it invi invites you to make commitments and let go of. Uh, and, and invite you to growth and let go of maybe even the things that no longer fit the 10x future. I, I feel like I'm so caught on just two things that Do are- Do it. Let's like, hear it. The fact that mastery of your past is that it, you, you get so good at your past, you shape your past or your, your, the meaning of your past so that it doesn't dictate your future. Yes. And, and your future is the David and you're stripping away everything that's not that. Yeah. So how I look at it is 
if, and I kind of do it in this way, where I think about the, the present as just the circle that we're living in. And overlapping, you've got the past, and overlapping, you've got the future, right? So for me, the future is what dictates who I am and what I do in the present. Not the present dictates who I'm going to be in the future, right? So the future is the filter for my present, and my present is my filter for the past. I think a lot of people have just like, gotten that crystal clear. Yeah. Whew. I mean, that's, that's a skill. Most people do it the opposite way. We're trained the opposite way. We're, we're trained that the past, is the, the, the past is driving me. That's even how psychology was as a discipline for 100 years, um, is, is that the past is you know, dictating who you are. Is all you got to do is just look at your history, and the history is what has determined who you are. You're just a domino, you know, essentially determinism. But also, most people, when they're in the present, even businesses, and, you know, I train now CEOs and business leaders, even companies doing really good, like big things. And um, even after training them on this, they will still default to linear approaches to the future where they're letting the current conditions decide what they'll go for in the future. It's like, no, 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 no. Remember, we're going to make a, a very big future that actually feels fairly impossible right now. And we're going to let that dictate what we do in the present. We're going to let that dictate the few things we're going to focus on and openly dictate the things that we know aren't relevant up there anymore, the things that we've got to change, you know, if you want to go for that, if you choose to go for that. So some of the questions we ask everyone who comes on the show is, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? And, and maybe the tag to that is, and would you have listened? Would my 20-year-old self have listened? Yeah. I mean, it's a good invite to say, what, am I listening to what my future self's asking? Right? Me? It's right. like, it's, it fits within this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if I would say anything, to be honest with you, as weird as it sounds. Uh, I know that that's probably um, the more interesting of what I would say to my 20-year-old uh, self is, uh, how in the present am I looking at my 20-year-old self? I know that that may sound weird, but... Um, I have the option in the present to look at my 20-year-old self in a ton of different ways. And, and I may end up changing this answer along the way. But um, who was I at age 20? I was literally getting ready to go and, and serve a church mission. Um, I really don't think, this may sound weird, I really don't think anything I could say now, no, that's not true. Um, I wouldn't say anything to them, honestly. Um, the only, I think that the main things uh, are... are, are most of ourselves need is, is, is assurance. And, you know, that's, that's pretty cliche, but just assurance that they're on the right path or that they're, that they're doing, you know, that they're, they're going to be fine. Um, we typically even need that now, um, that everything's going to be okay. Uh, we often are just questioning the uncertainty of the future, whereas obviously it's not uncertain to me anymore. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I wouldn't say anything to my past self. Um, Mainly for me, it's about getting better and better at um, being proud of my past self. Like mm. uh, something I heard recently uh, from from someone just that I know is is that they feel like their past self is their hero, which I think is actually really cool um, because you know I wouldn't be where I'm at if it wasn't for the the decisions my past self made. Certainly, like the hard work, um, the things that they went through, and so even though I'm different from my past self, even though I would do I would do things very different from even the 20-year-old self that I'm talking to, uh, I owe that version of me a huge amount um, for the decisions they made. What advice do you think your 20-year-old would have given you? My 20-year-old self could give me a huge amount of advice, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Uh, that would be useful. Um, I think my 20-year-old self, um, I think that they would, they would be shocked. They'd be extremely proud of me. Um, I think my 20-year-old self would be extremely proud of me. Hmm. Um, I think that they would be surprised um, by me having six kids, a PhD. I, I, certainly at 20 years old, I had just flopped out of uh, trying community college for the first time. I barely graduated high school. And so like, I had no view of myself getting a college degree, let alone a PhD. And so, um, but even still, I think that they would... Uh, I think my, my past self, 20-year-old self, would probably tell me to have more fun, honestly. They'd probably tell me to have more fun. They'd re-remind me of, uh, of, of little things that matter, um, that's, that, that could still matter and that maybe should matter more. Hmm. It's funny, as you say that, we were asking ourselves this question today. I, I've never, we've never really flipped it that way. 
And, uh, and that was what came back to me. I, I thought about it for a while. I thought, I think my 20 year old self would say, chill out. And, uh, and yeah, the question is, will I listen? You know, it's that, it's that, it, you know, if you think about it from a future self, will I listen now perspective, but from a, you know, that advice can be shaping in lots of ways too. Would I listen? I think so. it's a, I think what I like about what you're saying, um, is, is that I have a lot I could learn from my future self, but I also have a lot I could learn from my past self. And the question is, is am I listening to my experience, right? Exactly. exactly. Um, so I, I love it. I think it's beautiful. You brought up a couple rituals, routines. What are the, what are the ways that you block out your day in terms of habits, rituals? How do you do it? So I, I recently thought about my 2015 self, um, cause that was when I was blogging and I actually was more interested in habits and routines back then than I am now. Um, and so like, I would say my, um, I actually reviewed an article I wrote back in 2015 that was read 20 million times. And it was about the eight things that I did before 8 AM. And I literally reviewed them and thought to myself, how do I look differently at time than my past self did? I'd say the, the fundamental thing that I believe to be different is, is that rather than trying to optimize for a day, I'm way more interested. Like, so rather than trying to do the same thing every day to a certain event or to a certain uh, extent, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I think a lot more holistically than maybe like atomistically. Uh, and so I have a, a big picture future self, but also if I'm even thinking in terms of between now and the end of the year. Right, that's going to deeply inform, like, so think about like a quarter, like the next 90 days ahead. That's going to inform my strategy a lot more than just what I want to accomplish today. I feel mm-hmm. like habits are, are great. We all have habits, but I, uh, my habits for the next 90 days are going to look really different from the habits I had in the last 90 days. Um, and so I, I, I think bigger picture, there's a, a book that I read when I was writing 10X is Easier Than 2X that really informed my thinking. It was called Catching the Big Fish. Mm. Um, and catching the big fish is all about, um, consciousness and creativity. And he, and he compares our consciousness to the ocean and about how, if you're up at the surface is all you can see is small fish. And it takes going really, really, really deep to start seeing the big fish. And so that changed how I look at flow and how I look at routines in general. I think in the past, uh, I was interested more in what I would call cheap flow versus deep flow. So like for me, cheap flow is like get into a flow state for like 30, you know, 30, 60, you know, even 90 minutes and create some quick output, um, which for me is now what I would consider up at the shallow. Like, yes, I can create results, um, but it's not, it's not the deep enough work um, that is ultimately going to create something that could have a monumental impact. Yeah, you can get good at writing viral articles and stuff like that, but none of those viral articles are going to be innovative. <laughs> like, truly. Like, they're going to be shallow work. Like, they're, I mean, they could be innovative compared to other blog posts, but yes. you've got to go really, really deep um, as a way of life to, to do things that are very powerful, very useful. And so I now look at at things more holistically where it's like, rather than seeing how much I could accomplish today, it's more like what two or three big fish am I trying to accomplish this month? Which if I, if I, you know, design my weeks around those, it could be, you know, finishing a few chapters of my book. It could be going and traveling with my kid. It could be a certain goal uh, related to my work, but it's a lot bigger picture. And so now my, rather than doing the same routine every single day, it's more like, you know, what am I trying to accomplish this week? And like, what are the two or three, big things I want to do and then designing the week around those. Um, so it's a lot more about deep focus and even deep recovery rather than doing the same thing every single day, um, like the same wake up routine. And so like, as an example, this week may look different than next week. This week actually looks really different since I'm here in California, but like say this was a week where I was focused on my book. Um, I'd probably have three days with zero things on my calendar and like I would be really deep on the book and then I would have a full day off somewhere in the middle for recovery and then maybe a few meetings like on a Friday. Hmm. Um, but it, but the, you know, it's possible that I'm not in that phase where I'm writing a book. Maybe I'm working on some other goal or some other project. Um, so yeah, I'm more interested in depth and accomplishing less to greater effect rather than trying to, trying to 
um, do the same thing every day. Um, Interesting. And so, so do you I, I've worry, changed that. Yeah, because do you worry, I mean, to put it in the context of 2x, 10x, do you worry that getting too habit-based, too ritual-based keeps you in the 2x? I think habits as a concept, like if you actually study deliberate practice, deliberate practice is an antidote to habits. Uh, it's certainly like you can be in the habit of going out of your comfort zone, but like deliberate practice as a concept means you are not doing things the same way you did them yesterday. You're always trying new things. Mm. You're always pushing beyond the boundaries. And so um, obviously we all have habits, um, but um, for me, habits are a reflection of your current and your past self, you know, and you're, you know, you certainly don't have the same habits as your future self. That doesn't mean I don't do things regularly. I read books regularly. I write my journal regularly. So I guess you could call those habits. Um, but I'm not doing them mechanistically. I'm not doing them the same way every time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very less interested in habits and more interested in, uh, honestly, like what's required for what I'm trying to accomplish now, which is going to look different than what I'm, what I'm doing next year. And so I'm, I'm far more interested in like, what is the priority? What are we trying to accomplish? What's required? What's, you know, what's the core focus? Um, so, yeah, that's how I look at it. Let's go to, um, you know, the 100-year-old the future self. What, what do you hope your legacy is? I mean, I think the main things that matter to me are, you know, and I think my future self will have a much different answer. Um, so, I mean different answer to my future self, but my present self looking ahead, um, certainly family matters, matters a lot. Uh, doing good in the world. I'm, I'm someone who wants, like you said at the beginning of this, to have a positive, huge positive impact in the world uh, in specific ways. And so um, I'm like, I'm not really that thoughtful about my own legacy. I am more thoughtful about um, my family, uh, my faith, and just yeah, doing, I want to learn as much as I possibly can and make it as easy for other people, you know, mm. to speed their process. Mm. Um, um, so yeah, I just want to, I want to be as helpful as I can. How about that for an imprint? What, um, what's next? How do people find you? Uh, I'm writing a book right now called How to Stretch Time. So that's kind of a riff off of a, two thousand. like, so in 2015, I wrote an ebook. Um, this was when I was just barely starting to write. And I wrote a book called How to Stretch Time. It was a play on time dilation, um, time dilation in physics, but also in psychology, um, just like the slowing and stretching of time. So that would have to do with a lot with flow, but also in physics it has a lot to do with acceleration and, um, and other things. And so I'm, I'm writing that book right now, which is a huge amount of fun. Um, I'm definitely going to be collaborating with, with someone new. Uh, I, don't, I haven't fully de defined what that is or what that's going to look like, um, but I do love collaboration. Mm. I, I really like, uh, there's a, a model in psychology by a guy named Robert Keegan. He created what he calls the, the transforming self. And so there are three levels to this. One is, it's kind of like what Covey wrote as dependent, independent, interdependent. Um, um, Keegan's model is a lot deeper. But basically, the independent level of Keegan's is what he calls the authoring self. So this is where a lot of people get where they're authoring themselves. But the, the higher level of, of leadership is what he calls the transforming self. And that's, that's where parties come together with a shared goal, but they know that the collaboration is going to transform them. Um, the whole becomes different from the sum of the parts in surprising and non-predictable ways. And I will say that having gone, done, done deep collaborations, you know, I started my book career as an individualist, you know, like I was a big blogger and then I wrote a few books by myself and I chose uh, to collaborate and, you know, do a trilogy of books with someone with a wildly different reference frame than mine. And I will say that I think that it, it, it not only changed my direction, but sped a lot of, a lot of development that I would have never had. Um, certainly it, it also, everything has an opportunity cost. You know, I missed certain development if I would have just stayed an individualist. But I really love, um, I love collaboration. It changes things. And so, yeah, I'll just keep, I'll keep writing books. I've let go to the idea of the 80%. I've, you know, uh, let go of a collaboration that was deeply meaningful. I, I, uh, I've, for the last five years, I have had my own coaching program for entrepreneurs that 
makes up about 70% of my income that I've, you know, told everyone that it ends this year. Um, there's a wow. quote. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a quote from, <laughs> there's a quote from Aristotle where he says, uh, nature abhors a vacuum, you know, uh, the vacuum being space. You know, if there's an empty plot of dirt, weeds will grow. If there's five minutes, we're probably going to fill it with social media. And so to create that space and not fill it so fast is, is especially difficult in the modern world. And so I've, I've created massive space. And it's also, Tao Te Ching. <laughs> it's also space for the future, though. I think that often we're overly committing our future selves to things that maybe they don't want to deal with. And so I've, I purposely created a lot of space. Um, and I'm, I honestly, rather than going to my future self, I'm letting my future self come to me a lot faster. Mm. And so certainly books will be in there. Um, probably interesting collaborations that will look a lot different from what I've done in the past. And then... Uh, hopefully being a, a lot better husband and father. Hmm. And if someone wants to follow your journey, where do they find you? Uh, I would say just benjaminhardy.com. Certainly read the books. You can find them all on Amazon. Uh, 10X is easier than 2X, I think is probably my best work. And so I would probably, if you're, you know, if you're an entrepreneur or even just someone who's interested in high achievement, I would start with 10X is easier than 2X. Uh, even if you're not an entrepreneur, I would read it just because it, it che- teaches you a lot about identity. It teaches you a lot about uh, operating with a future lens versus a past lens. Um, so I'd, I'd probably read that, and I have a YouTube channel. Uh, so you could just go up Dr. Benjamin Hardy on YouTube. Master class. Dr. Benjamin Hardy, thank you. Sure, man. Happy to be here.